J'aimerais vous souhaiter la bienvenue à cette deuxième journée du Symposium étudiant du NIC. Donc, laissez-moi vous présenter brièvement l'horaire de la journée. Donc, j'aimerais tout d'abord remercier Sangmi et Nanda pour l'atelier qui s'est déroulé ce matin en présentiel sur l'étude des réseaux de neurones sous l'angle des systèmes dynamiques. Nous allons bientôt commencer avec la session des keynotes, avec la présentation d'Anna Levina. Après, euh, on va aller dîner. Et nous allons recevoir Patrick Desrosiers euh, pour une autre présentation. Nous allons terminer la journée avec une table ronde sur le futur de la neuro-AI et les changements climatiques. J'aimerais vous rappeler que c'est un événement en format hybride et les keynotes ainsi que les tables rondes seront euh, enregistrées et euh, rendues disponibles sur la chaîne YouTube du NIC. Tous les liens seront disponibles sur notre site Internet après l'événement. J'aimerais vous rappeler que le code de conduite est de mise en tout temps et euh, la viola toute violation de ce code ne sera pas tolérée. Le code de conduite est disponible sur notre site Internet. Également, j'aimerais vous rappeler que pour les questions, nous allons utiliser l'application Slido. Pour les gens en présentiel, le code de chaque euh, session va être mis sur le tableau blanc à l'avant et pour les gens en ligne, le code sera euh, rendu disponible dans le chat. Voilà, je vais laisser la place à ma collègue Teresa pour les, euh, le discours d'ouverture en anglais. Hello everyone, my name is Teresa and as a representative of the organizing team, I'm very happy to welcome you back to the second day of our symposium. Um, let me briefly introduce the program of today. So in the morning, we had a very nice workshop about studying neural networks through the lens of dynamical systems given by sang -Ni and Nanda. Thank you very much for the nice workshop. And now we will start off with our first keynote speaker of the day, Anna Levina. After lunch, then we will have Patrick Derosi, who will also give a keynote, and this will be followed by a panel about the future of neuro AI, climate change. And before I introduce Anna Levina, I would like to remind you that this is a hybrid meeting and it will also be live streamed on YouTube. And uh, in case you missed some of the sessions, we will also, uh, they are recorded and we will also put them on YouTube. And additionally, if you would like to ask questions, please use a uh, Sildo channel to put your questions and to upload questions that you like. And these are the questions that we will ask the speaker afterwards. Okay, and now without any further ado, I would like to introduce Anna Levina, also come to the floor and start presenting uh, your slides. Uh, Anna Levina did her PhD in mathematics in Saint, uh, from the St. Petersburg University and the Göttingen University in Germany. She then, then did a, a postdoctoral fellow at the Max Planck Institute for Mathematics and Sciences and became an independent research fellow at the IST in Austria. She's now an assistant professor in the University of Tübingen in Germany, and her group is funded by uh, the Humboldt Foundation, given by an award of the Sofia Kovalevskaya Award. And her group is about uh, self-organization and optimality in neural networks. We are really honored to have you here today, Anna Levina, and please take it away. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. Can you hear me? Yes, Does it can. work? Yes. Great. Then I will share my presentation. Oh no, the host disabled participant screen sharing. I cannot. Yes. You can try again, please. Okay, let's see. Yeah, much better. Okay. So very nice, unfortunately not see, but at least be virtually there. Uh, would really love to visit Quebec at some point. Uh, today, I would be talking about maintenance of specific neural states and how self-organization plays a role there. To start with, let's discuss what are the neural states or how can we define a state? In general, the simplest possibility would be if we can label the state behaviorally. For example, you can be falling asleep, I would not see it, uh, or you can be widely awake. And these are two different states that we very clearly can differentiate behaviorally. On the other side, there are also states like attention, uh, which 
uh, are possible to uh, observe in statistics, but sometimes are very hard to label on the sport. Uh, the uh, states that I am particularly interested in are states that are visible in neuronal activity. For example, it might be synchronization state as a cultures that we would see a, a bit later, or that were visible in sharp wave ripple complexes in hippocampus. There might be also a state that we can measure by mapping observations to physical uh, ideas. For example, we can label state by the closeness to the critical point. Which critical point I mean here? Uh, we can imagine a very simple spreading process, like a new spreading, for example. And there is a possibility that whatever information we put in, nothing spreads. This would be a state that we can label as subcritical. There is no spread, whatever we enter. On the other side, some things can spread exponentially. Uh, this would be a supercritical system. And in between, there is a state where uh, additional stimuli, input information uh, is neither dying out fast nor taking over the whole system. This line can be defined as a critical line, and it is uh, indeed matching what we know about second order phase transitions. If we would look at the systems in these three different states, uh, for example, like illustrated here, here on the x-axis, we have different nodes in our artificial network. And on the y-axis, we have time that evolves downwards. And there is initial activation put uh, somewhere in the middle of our system. Uh, in subcritical system, activity would die out, not reaching uh, the final time uh, after, for example, 100 time steps. On the other side, if we have a supercritical system, uh, after a relatively short period, the input would take over the whole system and uh, we would have everybody activated. Uh, in the much more interesting case, uh, on a borderline between these two, there are sometimes small events and sometimes large events, and there is a high variability and uh, interesting correlation patterns arising. So what would be uh, major questions we would study? First of all, whatever way we want to decide what the state is, particularly if it is a state decided by the activity of neuronal populations, how can we infer it from our recordings? Uh, typically, the recordings are very strongly subsampled, which means that we can record from only a very small part of the whole system. So we need to find the methods. Uh, on the other side, and this would be another large part of what I would be talking about today, how can the system self-organize as a preferred state? And the last part I would mainly skip today, uh, but it is not least important. Uh, what is the reason to select a particular state? How can the system profit from being in one or another state? So let's start with the question about how can we infer a state? So what would we like to have? If the brains and the skulls would work the way we want, this would look approximately this way. We would know for every moment of time which neuron where is activated, maybe even more exact information about different synaptic events. So something like this. But we are very far away from uh, doing it in the details. Uh, for some time, uh, this object was our best hope to get uh, well, especially and time resolved uh, information. This is a Utah array, uh, which has 100 contacts. Uh, currently, a much more modern, but still very subsampling system would be uh, provided by neuropixel probes that already can record thousands of neurons, but still it's much less that we would have in the real brain. So the question is, do something change because we observe only a small part of it? 
to get some idea about how things might change, we go to much smaller and simpler systems in the brain. Let's just imagine that there are a lot of you sitting in the room and uh, mentally try to answer a question. Who do you think has more friends? An average person currently in the room or an average friend of the person in the room? Or possibly with the mathematicians, some of us maybe, uh, we could think that these are both averages, so they should be all the same, it's all averages out. The crazy thing about this question is that if the room is very large and randomly selected, there is a correct answer to it. Namely, that an average person, the average friend of the person in the room has probably more friends. And this is already known for a while, and the same thing would also apply for your papers, your average, uh, co-author would be more successful, have larger indices, whatever, uh, than you do. Why this happens? It happens because in the case of the friend, person who has a lot of friends has much larger probability to be your friend than a random person. And uh, the group of the people in, in the room is potentially just a random subset of all people. So what we have, we have a sampling bias. When we look at the friends of already sampled people, we have a much larger chances to sample somebody who has lots of friends. What will happen if we eliminate sampling bias? So we would observe a small part of the system, but we would select randomly. Uh, the questions like this could be, for example, answered in a simple system like a scale-free network. Scale for network means that the distribution of the degrees of neurons, so how many or nodes, how many connections each node has, follows a Paolo with particular uh, exponent. So we take a scale free network from the name of it, we think if we take a part, so it's still scale free. It is without a scale, so no matter how close we look, it should look the same. And so we take a subset of the nodes and only connections between these nodes. And what was found already some time ago is that the simple procedure makes a network to not be scale-free anymore. So we had very simple question, very simple data, like the data we would be able to observe in the real world. We never can see the whole network. And we would not realize that this is a perfect scale-free network from our observations. What can we do about it? So one reasonable possibility would be that we can try to design the methods that explicitly account for the fact that we are subsampling. Uh, we uh, worked on it for a simple case of a random sampling, where we showed that with the help of specifically selected scaling, we can reconstruct the distribution in the whole system from observing a different subsamples. On the other side, we could also try to design maybe more indirect measures that would not be affected by the subsampling. We played with it for measures of complex uh, networks, for example, for continuous clustering coefficient. To, to define the state, we also can design such a measure. And this is what we would be talking about next few minutes, namely the autocorrelation time scale or the time scale of the process can serve as a proxy for the state. Uh, and let's now define what is it. So autocorrelation is a covariance of the signal with its time shifted version. So we shifted by a particular lag, we compute a covariance and normalize by the variance of the signal. This is a simple autocorrelation. It is a function of the shift. In a typical case, for processes observed in nature, quite often we would see the following shape of autocorrelations. So there is a decay that is quite often can be well captured by the exponential function. And because it is nicely captured by exponential function, a good thing uh, to 
this dependency would be to make a y-axis logarithmic. That's what uh, would be happening for most of the autocorrelation plots uh, in the following. And in log lean scale, this exponential decay would turn into a straight line. And the uh, time scale, the factor in the exponent would become a slope of the straight line. So the question is, it seems then to be very straightforward. We can take data, compute the autocorrelation from the data, and uh, estimate in log lean scale what is the best fitting line, or in linear scale what is the best fitted exponential. Uh, another a bit important point about this uh, time scales is that if we go to this special critical state, these time scales would diverge and uh, become uh, the time scales would become infinite. So let's come back to the possibility of working with the data to test whether we would be doing fine when we get the data and fit the exponential to it. We can um, generate the data from the model where we know by for sure what is the time scale. In this case, we use a stochastic process quite often seen in different physical models. It is an orstein Olympic process. What is important for us now is that the time scale is uh, put into it explicitly. So it is this parameter tau. And then we know what is the true shape of an autocorrelation function if we would generate a similar this process uh, for infinite amount of time. However, what if we are in a situation like in a normal neuroscience experiment, which means that we would be uh, observing the data only over the relatively short chunks of time. In this particular case, let's imagine that we have four millisecond, four, four seconds trials, and we take 500 of these trials. This is quite optimistic for behavioral experiments. But what we see here is that if we would do the straightforward fitting of exponential or straight line to the observed data, we would estimate the time scale to be much smaller than the time scales in the uh, ground truth process. And if we go towards more realistic durations of individual trials, we would get larger and larger underestimation of the uh, time scales. So there is indeed a statistical bias in how the time scales are evaluated or in the, in the shape of autocorrelation uh, uh, function. This bias was already known for a while. The earliest papers showing how to deal with it are uh, 1954. However, a strict solution for the bias problem can be obtained uh, only for very few generative processes. And we teamed up with Tatiana Engel from Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory and my PhD student, Roxana Zerati, who was doing the main heavy lifting for this project, to find out how can we uh, infer the state of the time scales uh, precisely, even though we have a short durations of the trials. And our main idea was that instead of trying to fit straight lines to the uh, log linear uh, autocorrelation functions, we can try to mimic the data. So what, would, uh, what did we propose? Uh, we decided that we would generate models that are our hypothesis. For example, the hypothesis might be that the process we want to characterize has two time scales, but we don't know which ones are these. Uh, then we can put in the parameters of the models that are respective time scales and the mixing coefficient between them and generate data from a simplest model that would have the time scales, namely from a combination a linear combination of two Einstein and Limbeck processes that have the time scales. 
beyond the parameters that defines the time scale, in our Steinulimbic process, we can shift uh, the whole process and we can uh, affect uh, the variance by the independent parameters. And so what we are doing, we are matching the statistics of observed data in terms of mean and the variance and trial duration. And then only evaluating what would be an autocorrelation function of our generated data. What we expect that if the uh, autocorrelations of the data and the model would be very closely coinciding, we actually uncovered the true time scales that would be the best, uh, uh, best match to the real ones. Because both processes, data and the, our generative process are faced with the same biases. So in the simplest way, we could just generate many, many parameters, check how large is the deviation from our correlation function, uh, and just select the smallest or the distribution of the smallest. Uh, we can also use adaptive procedures that would um, allow us to make the same uh, process much more data and time efficient. In the end, uh, we get out of the algorithm a distribution of possible parameters that are all generating a decent fit to this data. That's what we also expect to get. So this is a Bayesian process, and we know that there is a lot of variability. So a single parameter can hardly be the best solution to understand what's happening. Here we see examples for different processes. Uh, the first one is example for the process with single exponential, uh, single time scale. And here uh, we see that the direct fit that is always in the bluish colors is very strongly underestimating as we already expected. However, the posterior, approximate posterior distribution that uh, our Bayesian procedure gives is centered around the ground truth values. We could even introduce additional components into the model. For example, it can include also oscillations. And still, we would be able both to uncover the frequency of the oscillations and the true time scale uh, in the time series. And the same would work if we have multiple time scales, like in the example C, where we have two time scales. And instead of just matching the Ornstein Nuremberg process, we generate spikes treating the Ornstein Nuremberg process as a proxy for the rate. So we developed a method that finds correct time scales, uh, even for the short uh, durations of trials, uh, and do so, does so by using generative models. And it also uh, works reliably when we have oscillations or any other additional underlying processes. You can find uh, a uh, very comprehensive Python uh, package written by Roxana and the paper described in the method. Now, when we uh, have such a nice tool, we can use it on the real data. And as always, clearly what happens, we first had the data and then needed a tool to define uh, to define what's happening. Okay, let's uh, one second. Thanks a lot for saying that it is quiet. Let me uh, um, let me try changing the settings. Need to um, stop sharing to change the settings. I'm sorry. Um, is it better? Can somebody tell, is it louder now? I also read it, I also see the chat. Okay, good. 
uh, you could so please you even can also say something in the chat i have a uh, half of an eye on a chat so if you want some uh, additional explanations uh, don't worry and ask okay wait now i should just share again the correct window okay uh and then i can also in the spotlight that's much better okay uh so oh, so we come back to do the uh, real data. Change the, um, could you change your window? Is it right now? Sorry, I cannot see. I cannot could, hear you. Could you change your window? Because right now we see your presentation a little bit smaller and we see all your windows you have behind it. OK, OK, that's amazing. Thanks for telling. Uh, I should stop sharing. I thought I should the same one. That's a PT. Does it work now? No, now we see uh, your emails. I, you see my emails. My emails are great, uh, very interesting as well. Yes. Uh, but uh, uh, particularly about the invitation, I'm kind of a bit annoyed because I'm sharing the right screen by the. Okay, wait. I'll unshare. I hope it doesn't mean that I need to close all my browser windows. <laughs> I mean, this would be a real sacrifice. <laughs> Okay, um, so. you can probably just share your. So that, 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 does it work now? Yes, it works. Thank you very much. Oh, Perfect. Thank you. Okay, but somehow, oh, here I still can get my pointer. Sorry, no we'll try to okay. come you. back uh, to thinking what was it uh, before. Uh, so the last thing that we managed before starting to optimize things were that we could evaluate time scales. Uh, and now we apply our hard won knowledge uh, and optimization of uh, presentation uh, to the data that was collected by Nicholas Steinmetz in Thierry Moore's lab together with, uh, and Mark Isselman in Alexander Thielen labs, uh, lab, and this uh, data from area V4 uh, recordings, so visual monkey area um, with uh, multi electrode array that has 16 contacts and is inserted perpendicular to the cortex. So all the contacts are approximately in the same. Uh, hypercolumn. We used the um, observations that, are done, uh, that were done before by Tatiana Enger that this electrode switching between high and low activity uh, very synchronous and collapse everything on a single uh, timeline to make it more data for the same amount of record, recorded time. Uh, a monkey had to perform a special attention task so it had to report the changes in the uh, in this Gabor uh, like structure. Uh, it was given a queue in which of the in this case four corners uh, change would most probably uh, happen, and then it had to report uh, by doing an anticipate. This way. Uh, if the change happened in one of these two locations, whereas we record 
from the neurons that have receptive field in this lower left corner, this we would call attention away condition because attention is not directed neither towards the uh, actual um, visual field of the um, recorded neurons nor to the, to the reporting direction. And we can uh, combine a lot of trials that were performed by a monkey uh, in this condition and get the following autocorrelation function. Uh, here already in log-lin scale. What we see here is something maybe interesting happening in the beginning, and then it looks quite like our uh, autocorrelation functions with a single exponential, where then for the large lags we would have uh, a bias. So what we could assume hypothesize, so far we did, did not check it, that maybe there are two time scales. One is a fast time scale that affecting mainly a short lags. And another one is much slower. Here, fast and slow, we see by the slope, the steeper the slope, the faster the time scale. And now we can look at the data from the trials where monkey was attending towards the receptive field or had to report. Uh, towards the receptive field. Oh. And in this case, uh, we see similar, but a bit different uh, picture. For the short lags, we have a nice overlap. Uh, the, it looks like same thing is affecting the attention away and attention towards receptive field condition. However, for the large lags, the decay is small, slower, so we can assume that slow time scales are changing uh, and increasing uh, during attention. So let's check with our now relatively rigorous methods whether this hypothesis can be verified. What we did, we fitted one and two time scale models. We could use the Bayesian procedure to also select which model fits in the best data and establish that two time scale model is indeed better uh, fitting what's happening than one time scale model. And then we could show that the first time scale, the short uh, uh, fast time scale, is not changing between attention towards the receptive field and attention away condition. However, the uh, long time scale is longer when monkey is attending towards the receptive field. Additionally, we were very excited to find that if we look at the behavioral data, namely at the reaction times of the monkey uh, before reporting which direction the change was happening, we find that if monkey attended towards the receptive field of our recording population, the, time, the, the long time scale is predictive for how long it would take to react. The uh, longer time scale seems to indicate some kind of uh, behavioral state that is uh, better to make a fast uh, responses. However, if we would look at these populations while monkeys attending to a different location, we don't see any correlation. And also in the first time scale, there is no correlation there. So what we see that there are two time scales and only slow time scale is modulated in the local population, local because our electrodes record just from single uh, column uh, during the spatial tension task. And these time scales uh, seem to be related with the behavioral states. So from this, we switch to try identifying how this changing of time scales might be important. So this one we skipped very fast uh, because here I want to just note uh, that it was shown that being very close to the critical uh, point where the time scales would be infinitely long. Uh, was uh, bringing a lot of various computational advantages for the system, uh, especially in terms of information transfer and storage and sensitivity to external stimuli. 
which brought by hypothesis that maybe this is the state for the brain functioning. And indeed, in multiple uh, experiments, they were found uh, signatures of, of criticality. However, I must add here is that uh, it's also a lot of data that shows that some other states might be important. Uh, so there is a big question for the large field, whether the brain network should operate at a critical point or whether it should be changing. Uh, as I showed in the attention experiment before, it seems to be changing flexibly, uh, not being at a critical point, but shifting towards the longer time scale, so closer to a critical point while performing an attention task. And uh, the last main uh, topic would be how can we see the signatures of self-organization to preferred uh, state and which mechanisms are involved in it? Uh, first of all, there were already observations that simple systems, in this case, these are slices, mm, cor cortical slices, uh, seem to develop back towards criticality if they are perturbed. Uh, so in this uh, original paper, the first paper that uh, strongly discussed a particular measure for being close to criticality, namely neuronal avalanches, uh, authors also applied uh, picrotoxin, the uh, inhibition modulating agent that would block inhibition, then state changed. Uh, here we, we Mm, infer the state by closeness to the power law of the distribution uh, of the event sizes. And then after the chemical agent was washed out, uh, after a while, there was uh, adaptation back. The uh, system was possibly not adaptive enough to adapt completely, but we see that after wash out, a state is different than before and seemed to overshoot to, to uh, in decrease the excitability more than necessary. Uh, additionally, on the developing cultures, uh, it was shown that they seem to develop towards some kind of critical state. Uh, and uh, what was also discussed, balance of excitation and inhibition might play an important role in this development and in the state it would uh, be uh, obtained in the end. We recently reviewed so far demonstrated, uh, particularly the models, mechanisms for uh, self-organization towards a critical state. And generally we can uh, put them into two baskets. A short-term plasticity that seems a little bit like a reaction towards the ongoing uh, variable dynamics. Uh, already ages ago, uh, I was uh, studying in my PhD how this uh, could allow system to hover around the critical state and not go away for a very broad range of parameters. However, this way, uh, it is important to always have this mechanism switched on. Uh, as soon as it is switched off, the system would wander somewhere away. On the other side, a lot of learning is based on the long-term changes that could be uh, generated by long-term plasticity and that have an idea that there would be a fixed point somewhere that would be exactly the critical point that we could uh, converge the system towards this place by adapting synaptic strings mm -hmm. with the long-term synaptic plasticity that we afterwards can also switch off and the system would stay there. But these models were typically matching some one particular uh, observation from the experiments uh, to uh, get a better explanation of what we can now see in the real data that became much richer over the last uh, few years, uh, we need a better models. And we can also look at the systems where maybe it's a bit easier to grasp how the self-organization happens. 
So here, together with uh, uh, Elisha Moses and Mirit Zukinik uh, from Weizmann Institute of Sciences, uh, we look at what happens if one chronically perturbs excitation inhibition balance. Uh, Elisha and Mirit developed a beautiful experimental setup where they grow dissociated cultures, so what's from a hippocampus. Uh, so what's happening, they take hippocampus out and uh, dissociate the cells. So every cell is floating by itself. There are no connections. Then the new thing that was not done in this context before, they are using fluorescence activating sorter, uh, a sorting um, machine then that uses that the mice uh, used in this experiment uh, expresses a fluorescent protein uh, for the uh, in the inhibitory cells, uh, and this allows to split automatically excited cells from inhibitory. Then we have two flasks with two different cell types, uh, and we can mix them together in different proportions. In cortex and hippocampus, proportion of excitation inhibition is very strongly preserved, uh, even starting from relatively uh, early embryonic stages. So when we change the numbers of excitatory inhibitor cells, we expect that something might happen. Uh, but first we need to check whether everything worked. Uh, Nirit uh, counted the cells. Here we see in red inhibitory uh, neurons. And uh, when we see that something, when the intent was to see zero percent of inhibitor cells, there was approximately four percent seeded, uh, and so on, particularly on the sites uh, close to zero or 100 percent of, inhibit of inhibitor cells. There were some deviations, but uh, in general setup worked. And the normal fraction would be somewhere over here between 20 and 30 percent. So this is how the activity in this cultures look like. It's beautiful, but maybe a bit boring because it is mainly uh, comprised of uh, large population bursts. However, those bursts are coming irregularly and can be characterized by the interburst intervals and also by the burst sizes. Uh, what uh, Elisha and Nirit were very happy about uh, was as a first step that even the cultures that have almost only inhibitory cells or the cultures that have only, almost only excitatory cells, all of them showed these bursts. Potentially, we could have expected that they would die and would not be able to produce an activity. And if they don't produce activities, they also die. Uh, so mm, there were a lot of things that uh, could have gone wrong. However, all of them produced population bursts. And actually, most of them produced very similar population bursts, except for very small and very large fractions of inhibitory neurons. Here, I show the statistics of population bursts expressed in terms of interburst intervals, uh, particularly the sizes, the, the mean interburst intervals, and coefficient of variation of interburst interval. And now uh, me and my PhD student, Alek Vinogradov, uh, came in and tried to model what's actually happening there. Uh, we found out that if we use a model of simple randomly connected uh, excitatory and inhibitory populations, uh, we can match the data pretty exactly. Uh, however, if we just use a static uh, connectivity and no adaptation, we would not be able to match the coefficient of variation of interburst intervals. They would be uh, always Poisson-like, so would have CV of one. Uh, however, if we add uh, an adaptation current, we can match uh, the model pretty well. What does it mean, match the model? Here, I use the same idea as uh, I showed already for the understanding the uh, 
autocorrelation time scales. We use the mod uh, we use the model as a proxy uh, to understand the parameters. So we would uh, take a model with the particular parameters, generate the data, check whether the statistics of interbest intervals is similar to the real uh, observations or not. And if it is similar, we preserve this uh, parameter set as matching. This way, we generate a posterior distribution. And here, I show you what would happen for so-called wild type culture. So we take uh, from hippocampus directly and we don't sort, we just take the proportions that was there. Uh, what I uh, show on the x-axis is a deviation from the balance between excitation and inhibition. And here, the balance is measured by the strengths multiplied by the number of synapses. And we vary uh, the number of synapses because this is what these developing cultures can actually uh, very strongly affect. This is what they are doing from a state where there is no connections, they are growing connections. And we assume that they might grow more or less connections, possibly depending on the number of excited or inhibitor cells. So this is the best fitting model for the wild type system. It's relatively close to the balance. However, if we would shift the model away from, if we would shift the number of inhibitory neurons away from this wild type fraction, but would not adjust anything in the model, this distribution would turn into this wide range of possible distributions that would also move very far away from the balance, particularly uh, if we have no inhibitory neurons at all or uh, only inhibit, almost only inhibitory neurons there, it would be very far away from balance. Uh, however, if we fit the model separately for each of these uh, conditions, we find that in all cases, the best fitting model are very close to the balance, uh, especially compared to how far it would be uh, if no adaptation towards the balance would be uh, performed by the neurons. So we formulated a hypothesis that the neurons possibly uh, adapt the number of synaptic contacts to match the excitation inhibition cell counts. And with this, uh, we uh, went to Menahem Segal, who patched neurons in a very juvenile cultures uh, and recorded spontaneous postsynaptic uh, currents, like we see here. So spontaneous means that we block spikes. Uh, it is bathed in a, a chemical solution of TTX that prevents neurons to fire. In this case, we can measure what is the statistics of the sizes of postsynaptic uh, signals that the neuron uh, gets. And assuming that there was an adaptation towards, towards the balance, there could be two different possibilities. One is that if we have more inhibitor cells, then the size of excited synapses, the strength of this uh, small events would be larger when we have more inhibitor neurons. Or it could be the way we proposed that uh, the sizes of the spontaneous uh, currents are not changing, but the frequency changes that would mean that there are more synapses uh, formed. And indeed, uh, this is uh, what was uh, observed. However, uh, here we need to keep in mind that it is a juvenile cultures where there is still no, no so-called GABA switch. So the, all the neurons act more or less like excitatory. They don't, uh, they don't have very strong difference between excitation and inhibition, and mainly measure excitatory currents. Uh, and here, the blue are the inhibitory patch cells and the red are excitatory patch cells. We see that there is no change in the uh, sizes of post currents, but there is a change in the rates. 
So altogether, here we could formulate a theoretical uh, model that proposed the mechanism for adaptation by changing the number of connections, which was uh, later verified in the patch clamp experiments. And thus, we established that there is uh, balancing uh, performed by neurons in terms of adjusting the numbers of excitatory and inhibitory connections. Here, uh, we talk on a very general uh, scale. This is just uh, probabilities of forming connections. However, quite often, it's much more interesting to have a more specific connectivity. And that's what we also investigated in a very similar model of uh, balanced networks with uh, synaptic plasticity. Here, we take, again, uh, excitatory and inhibitory populations, but we take them as a novel type with 20% uh, inhibitory neurons. Uh, and we add plastic changes on top. Uh, in form of uh, SCDP rule on excitatory inhibitory and inhibitory excitatory um, uh, synapses. So here it is important we also have an inhibitory SCDP. So we have both. Uh, and this is just an experimental evidence. And there are now more and more uh, experimental evidence for various shapes of inhibitory CDP. So this is a long-term learning of uh, synaptic connectivity. And we can just generate a homogeneous connectivity, randomly selected uh, adjacency the matrix, but same weights, and then uh, let it up, uh, update by the plasticity rules and see where it converges. And what we found that if we have an inhibitory uh, and excitatory um, plasticities together, we get a very interesting structure formation. Instead of having just a simple uh, normal distribution of excitatory excitatory connections, we get something that looks more or less like a Paolo with some fraction of neurons that uh, form very strong synapses. And the rate has very much log normal shape as it is expected uh, from observations. Uh, mainly from Bojaki lab. And what it gives us additionally is that there are uh, some neurons shown here in red that have very strong mean outgoing weights and high frequency uh, or high firing rate. So they are uh, evolving using the combination of plasticity rules. And now we can also see what they can do if we stimulate them they can generate uh, a long and large response in the network, whereas when we simulate the same number of random neurons, nothing happens. However, this is now an observation of a nice structure formation that uh, is not necessarily keeping the balance. Here, the balance was kept by the scaling. We would need as a next step to use this two plasticity methods together and also see how does it change the uh, dynamical state of the network. And the last very short glimpse in what would happen if we zoom out of looking at the brains alone and put the artificial brains into small agents, like here. These agents are trying to forage the blue dots that are food particles, and each of them has a, a tiny network that connects the motors that rotate and accelerate uh, the creatures uh, and with the sensors. And the network is uh, done in the spirit of physics as an Ising, uh, as an Ising model, where uh, we could observe with evolutionary uh, strategies how these uh, creatures uh, evolve. And we can evolve it in a very simple task, starting initiating our uh, brains at the critical or the green or subcritical blue states. Uh, we already see that if the brains are a bit larger, so there is a larger complexity of potential computational device, uh, a critical ones would be very good at evolving uh, and subcritical ones have some troubles. 
And if the task is very hard, which uh, in this case means that uh, agents have to break before eating the food, so it has to approach it and break, then uh, the subcritical agent is not managing to solve them at all with the simple evolutionary strategies where critical ones can do it easily. Uh, however, maybe evolution changed their state and we developed a method to infer rather precisely for the simple agents, what were their states by uh, trying to evaluate the specific heat and measuring this way a deviation from the critical state. For the details, uh, ask or go to the paper. Uh, and what we found out that for all of these agents, the distance to criticality, even if we uh, start them at the critical point, uh, increases and the, all the agents develop to be subcritical for the simple task. And for the hard task, a similar thing happens, but it seems like they keep the state a bit closer to the critical one and the strongly subcritical uh, initiation results in no solution at all. Here, the color code is for how successful the populations were uh, and the y-axis shows the distance to criticality. We can test it. Um, Statistically, and we see that although they all develop towards a subcritical regime, the uh, agents in a simpler task, the light green, uh, are remaining uh, more subcritical than the agents in a harder task, which allows us to formulate the hypothesis that would need much more time to test, uh, that uh, it is important to keep the state close to critical to be evolvable independent on uh, how hard is the task that you would next need to solve. So we see that all the agents, all the population solving a task, I'm finishing, uh, and, um, sorry, uh, and uh, the evolution makes the state colder, but stays closer to the critical uh, state for, uh, for the harder task or larger brains. So here it is just like a perspective that possibly for different tasks, we might need different states and it might be important to be able to evolve to different states and maintain the flexibility. So to just summarize a bit uh, what I was talking to you about. First of all, we've seen that subsampling changes what we would infer from observations also what possibly would be states that we infer from observations, but we can use theoretical insights to combat the distortions that are brought by subsampling. It looks like neuronal populations can change flexibly their states, possibly modulated by the task demands, and that plasticity rules and adaptation uh, could uh, constrain and control uh, the possible uh, states that uh, neural populations can attain. There are a lot of things that we could do further. One thing is that our method so far can allow the inference from the subsample systems only under relatively simple assumptions about how the subsampling is working. So it would be very interesting to understand how this happened, how to do this if the system is very non-trivially structured and the sampling is not random. Uh, what would be additionally important is to learn how the combination of various plasticities and adaptations could uh, bring a state towards something that is good for computation. And clearly to be able to predict what is an optimal state from knowing what is a task and what are possibly biological constraints that the system has to solve it. So with this, I would be happy to hear your questions. And I thank my uh, uh, home institutions and uh, great people who funded my research. And a lot of thanks to, um, to people I'm happy to work with uh, in my lab and in theoretical and experimental collaborations. Thank you. 
Sorry, I cannot hear you if you're saying something. Yes, exactly. Thank you very much. That was an excellent talk. We really enjoyed it. Unfortunately, you couldn't hear, but we had a large applause in the room from the audience. Uh, they really enjoyed it. <laughs> and we also have a couple of questions uh, for you. Um, so one of the questions that we have is, um, could you use the Ornstein Uhlenbeck uh, generative model to infer networks parameters even in cases when not all the neurons acti um, actives are observed, even if not all neurons yeah. are active. <laughs> yes, uh, this is exactly our uh, kind of uh, trick there. Uh, the time scales of activity of even single neuron already reflect input from the rest of the network. Sure, it's not always homogeneous, so that's also what I show, that uh, the neurons that are receiving the input uh, from attended locations seems to behave differently than the neurons uh, from a non-attended part of the receptor, uh, for the population that is attending to the other receptive fields. Uh, however, it uh, seems like within this population, we could use the single, even single neuron or the populational time scales as a proxy for the state. And this way also somewhat includes the unobserved part of population because it gives an input uh, and also influences the time scales of observed units. This is definitely also not uh, true for all the systems. If you imagine like two completely not connected networks, they might have very different time scales. The uh, neurons here would not be able to tell anything about the other ones. But uh, here we use the hope that the network or our knowledge that the cortical networks are quite well connected. And so we can use this few neurons or even a single neuron to infer the state at least locally. Thank you. Another question would be, there are several types of criticality um, that have been described, like avalanche, uh, edge of chaos, edge of synchrony. Uh, which one do you think is the most useful to study the brain? Hmm, that's a very good question. Uh, I think what is very important for us theoreticians to, to somehow uncover is how they are related to each other. Uh, I feel that uh, somehow, so far, the age of synchrony was a little bit underrepresented, though there are some models also investigating uh, age of synchrony. What we know uh, is that from physical point of view, a lot of uh, features that are used in these optimal computations are arising at the second order phase transition. So we want a system that would behave as a second order phase transition. This could be a bifurcation, but this should be a bifurcation that continuously changing the fixed point. So something like a hysteretic jump to a very far away fixed point would not would be more like a first order phase transition, it would not say, be associated with optimalities or the long spatial and temporal correlations that we believe system can, abuse, can use uh, for computations close to the critical point that is at the second order phase transition. However, uh, how we obtain, obtain the features, the properties of this uh, is, uh, or how do we infer whether this is a state or not, it is a bit hard to say. So I would say that I hope that most of the bifurcation transitions that are associated with optimality are similar and can be brought together with uh, avalanche-like dynamics. But avalanches are, in a sense, a proxy. So the avalanche size is then a proxy uh, to understand uh, the state. So Mm, kind of proxy for order parameter. And the, what we believe that underlying change is something like a bifurcation that we see manifesting itself in this distributions of uh, uh, averages, this is at least how I believe it works. Very nice. I have another question that's maybe also in line with that. Um, does criticality provide a model that uh, nicely describes the dynamics of brain function, or do you see it uh, as degenerative uh, framework to the underlying brain functions? So I believe that 
maybe I managed to hint in this direction that there, put, there could be various optimal states. The one part that I uh, um, glance over was that sometimes being very critical is actually bad because uh, being critical means that you would also very strongly react to noise. In the noisy environment, if you don't have a lot of time to average or to somehow use any technique to get rid of the noise, it might be not really beneficial to be exactly at a critical point. Uh, and we have a model that shows that various distances to criticality and other researchers also show that uh, in different contexts could be optimal depending on situation, difficulty of the task, uh, and so on. So it's still then projection on a single dimensional line that is definitely much more simple than, uh, than the brain. What I think it might help uh, to compare that, that this line might be reasonable to compare between different systems and different states. It's definitely a lossy projection. So we don't know everything about the brain from just as humans that it is critical. However, it might give us a tool to compare between maybe different disease states, maybe different potential states, maybe different something that would be sensitive to uh, parameters that are also impacting computations. So I believe it's lossy, but it is relevant. Yeah, thank you very much. There is more a technical question. Um, in fact, uh, when you talked about, uh, sorry, I lost the question. It's coming back up. Conscious. Okay, yes. Uh, the Asian, um, the question is, um, how uh, does the agent evolve in your simulation? Did you use a genetic algorithm? Yes. In this particular case, we use very simple genetic algorithm with uh, mutation and something like sexual reproduction, like mating and mutation and elitism. Uh, but uh, we also try it with a different evolutionary strategies and got similar results. It's still not sufficient to say that this is like a very general um, underlying principle. It fits, uh, at least to my understanding, that the um, environment for agents is very noisy, being very critical is not really great. They have a clear strategy. If we were steering these agents, we would just say, okay, navigate to, towards the closest food, use your sensors. Uh, so for us, it's not hard to um, implement an algorithm. It's much harder in this network. So we made the task harder for the agents with just two neurons that would be doing better, possibly if this neurons would be properly connected. Mm. However, this allows us to probe these different states and availability. Okay, nice. And um... Maybe also, uh, what is the difference actually between the avalanche state and the age of calm state? So uh, avalanches are observables. Age of chaos is actually the state. So avalanches or particular statistics of avalanches can be used as a proxy, possibly also as a proxy for transition to chaos. So uh, it was, uh, in my understanding, not very clearly brought together. There are some models where we could see, for example, in the of exponents, that there is some uh, transition and we don't see it in avalanches. So it's not exactly perfectly matched yet. But in the reality, I think if you can really, like if you have a model, you have your equations, you know, uh, what are the level of exponents and fixed points and local linear stability? You can identify states better knowing the, your full model, especially if it is simple, if it's not like a huge couple dynamical systems that you cannot really find a high dimensional fixed point uh, than by looking at avalanches. However, in many cases you cannot, maybe even don't have an equation to uh, to write for a model. Maybe this is a model that has a lot, a lot, a lot of coupled differential equations. It would not have such a simple um, structure where we would be able to identify uh, nice fixed points and uh, transitions. So I would say that avalanche is like a statistical tool 
and edge of chaos if we can like if we know mathematically that this edge of chaos is a true transition state that we can very clearly mathematically label and then with avalanches we can clearly mathematically label it only if it is a pure branching process Okay, thank you very much. I think I'm going to read the last question because we're starting to be over time, uh, which would be directed to earlier in your talk. Is the graph subsampling problem only a problem in scale free networks or in other topologies, for example, small words? That's a very good question. So, uh, what it depends on what we want to observe, basically. Uh, if we want to observe something that is related to the property of the whole graph, like some kind of conglomerate feature, uh, in the case where we observe only the um, edges between the observed nodes, these uh, degrees are actually the feature of the whole su observed subset. Uh, we could imagine a situation where we randomly pick up people on Twitter and look at how many followers they have. In this case, we would actually sample the degree distribution pretty well because we would uh, not depend the measure that we, uh, uh, the, the, that we investigate on which particular ones we sample. Uh, so if we are studying this kind of compound measures, we would have effects that we would have changes in observed distributions, uh, also not only for scale-free graphs. For some of them, we could analytically compute, if we randomly subsample, what would happen. Say with a degree distribution, this is relatively simple. Say uh, we had a normal distributed degrees distribution. So if we subsample, we would have a normal distributed with the different means and variances. So we can compute easily what would be changing. If we did not know what is the probability of sampling before, we have some trouble. But the scale three is just a very particular case uh, where uh, the scale freeness and not just uh, particular numbers are a feature. So uh, we would have effects also for non-scale three networks and for some of them we can reverse them. Uh, but in this particular case, we're much more interested in scale-free networks because there we change how we perceive the network. Thank you very much. That was a very nice talk. Thank you for taking your time. And I would like to invite the audience for a large applause, even if maybe uh, Dr. Levina is not going to hear it, but thank you anyway. Uh, I don't hear it. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Uh, was uh, great. Thank you for a very nice and numerous questions. Uh, Let's hope we'll see each other at some of the conferences. Exactly, that's a good idea. Have a great uh, rest of this uh, nice meeting and goodbye. Goodbye, thank you very much.